Thank you all for joining us for live Q&A with Dr. Mark Dirksen from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. This session is a compliment to the bite-sized lunchtime talk you've already watched. I'm delighted to hand the mic to our six Howard Mathematica Alumni Legacy Teaching Fellow, Regis Saxton, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Nanette. Uh, Dr. Mark Dirksen is a research associate at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. His research focuses on Africa's unparalleled urbanization and the security challenges and opportunities this presents. Dr. Dirksen closely follows Nigeria, Africa's largest urban population, and its tumultuous political and urban histories. Dr. Dirksen holds a PhD in African history from Harvard University and a BA in political and social thought from the University of Virginia. Dr. Dirksen's projects at the Africa Center include tracking security-related news and strategic trends across the continent and creating analytic maps and infographics to visualize spatial patterns and historical precedents. I'm going to pass the mic back to you, Nanette. Thank you so much, Regis. It's always great to share space with you. Not that I have favorites, but Regis is way up there from folks from last year. Uh, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, we, we tend to, to ask for cliff notes. I don't know if, if the, the young folk know what those are. Uh, maybe it's a ask for the Wikipedia description. So for those folks who are not in this room, uh, who have not watched your video yet, can you uh, give us some background on what you talked about and also give us a sense of how you found your way into this incredible research? Yeah, um, thanks, Annette. And thanks, Regis, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so the cliff notes. Um, I heard that I covered a lot in the presentation, uh, but mainly what I tried to do was just give a um, kind of an overview of where disinformation in Africa stands today um, and, and what we know about it, because there's there's still like a, way more than than we um, know we don't know. Um, and so my talk was based on a report I had um, put together um, in in May of this year. Um, just looking at every detected and publicly documented disinformation campaign um, that we know about in the continent. Um, and so I tried to be as exhaustive as I could be. Of course, I, I miss some and, you know, it's um, people who are really deep into um, looking at social media networks in Africa say that this is likely just the, the tip of the iceberg um, to what's out there. But, you know, there's, there's only so many actually only a handful of researchers at the moment really digging into these campaigns that are being um, conducted um, and used to distort social media spaces in Africa. Um, and so we broke down, um, you know, it's about 50 to 60 of these campaigns. So um, the countries that they're targeting, who was behind them, um, kind of the, the tactics that they're using um, to create um, inauthentic and coordinated content um, to kind of um, distort the conversations that are happening online um, and often you know around political issues um, and then looked at kind of the objectives who was you know why these actors were doing this kind of what the, the end goal was um, and then to the extent that we could what the impact has been um, how many users these campaigns reached um, how many times they were liked reshared engaged with um, to kind of uh, gauge a sense of, of, wow, this is actually really having an impact. Um, a lot of people are seeing this, this manipulated information. Um, and, and when they go online, um, that they're, they're not, you know, engaging as social media spaces are intended to be with, um, you know, their friends, their family, um, their groups online. Oftentimes those are being infiltrated now by other actors who are trying to um, kind of make it really difficult to um, understand what's happening politically, economically, socially in a country um, for ends that, that, you know, benefit those actors for, um, you know, breaking the democratic process, especially, and making it harder for people, you know, making people just basically disengage from politics is um, oftentimes the, the end goal for these kind of campaigns. Um, so that was... That was the gist of the, the presentation. Now I'm in, in Kenya and, and it's, it's really a fascinating time to be here. Um, so I'll just add like a little addendum to, to my presentation because um, I've been learning so much while I'm here. Um, so, so Kenya has a really um, 
important election coming up on August 9th. It's a, a presidential election. Um, and it's, it's going to be a really competitive election because the current president, um, President Kenyatta has reached his, his two term limit. Um, so he is, um, unlike um, a number of leaders the last few years on, on the continent, he's not vying for a, a third term or trying to change the constitution. He's stepping aside. Um, so that's a, a positive development. Um, and his vice president is going up against um, an individual who is, I think this is his sixth time um, challenging for the presidency. Um, and the interesting thing is that the president is not supporting his vice president. He's supporting the opposition figure. Um, so that's caused um, all kinds of tension. It's been a very heated campaign when the, the president and the vice president aren't really talking to each other or um, communicating. Um, and Kenya, while it's, um, you know, it's, it really is a, a vibrant democracy um, by, by all accounts. Um, and, you know, just in 2007, in, in the aftermath of that presidential election, there were um, over a thousand people killed in political violence um, as the, the results were disputed. And um, I think it was over 600,000 people were displaced by that violence. Um, so that was, you know, really a breakdown of um, the democratic process and of, of dialogue and using courts and the rule of law to um, you know, deal with that kind of election dispute. Um, and so out of that came a, um, you know, a, a peace process, a unity government, a new constitution um, that by all accounts has um, really been pretty effective. Um, Supreme Court overruled um, the um, previous election and, and made it, um, you know, had it rerun because of irregularities. So all this to say, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's, things are going pretty well, um, but there's also now this new challenge of a lot of disinformation around the election, a lot of uh, disinformation campaigns, um, pumping this, these false narratives about the opposition, about the electoral process, about voting into um, Twitter, um, you know, recently, um, TikTok has now become the new platform where I was just talking to an author of a new report um, that that's that's now where um, a lot of this this disinformation is going and not being moderated. Um, and so the fear is while the rhetoric kind of on the political campaign trail has really been ratcheted down since the, the 2007, 2008. Um, it's being ratcheted up online and there's, you know, some of these TikTok videos, some of these um, Twitter hashtags are, you know, borderline inciting violence, um, inciting ethnic hatred. Um, so it's, it's kind of, you know, once again, um, the, you know, a democracy is going to have to react and keep developing tools to, to address these problems. So, um, Hopefully it won't be like 2007. I think most people are pretty optimistic, but there is this new challenge on the prize. And, and, and um, you know, I think it really just underscores how important it is to deal with um, these disinformation campaigns as part of um, you know, building uh, healthy democracies. Um, and, uh, TikTok, so I'll, I'll TikTok, is, uh, TikTok is interesting because there have been calls in the United States recently uh, for, for us to revisit whether we should ban TikTok. So uh, in, interesting. Uh, Interesting thing to think about. So I, I want to note to everyone that this is an amazing data set. Uh, if you don't follow Chris Bale, one of our founders, uh, tweeted about this talk uh, by Mark, uh, and uh, and also mentioned this that the fact this is an incredible data set. If you're interested in disinformation on the continent, uh, there's also a great video from last year uh, from Fact Space West Africa and Fake Net AI. Uh, if you have not connected with them, Mark, I, they, they could be uh, fun fun folks uh, for for joint work. Um, so uh, I just want to point people to those videos from last year as well. Uh, so can we, uh, so we want to try and squeeze in as much time for questions as possible. So I have a few, and then I also know our audience has a few. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about uh, the difference in manifestations of disinformation between uh, the African continent as opposed to the Americas or Europe or Asia, uh, if you could uh, spend a little time on that. Sure. Um, yeah. So um... Disclaimer, I'm not an expert by any means on uh, American or European or Latin American disinformation. Um, but a couple of points. Um, so one 
interesting thing is, is that um, so there was a, obviously a lot of um, disinformation around um, the U.S. Um, presidential campaign in 2016, um, and the um, U.S. government um, investigated that and placed sanctions on um, the individual that I, I mentioned multiple times in the presentation, um, Prigozhin, uh, in the Wagner Group um, and the Russian um, Internet Research Agency for those campaigns against the United States for kind of, um, uh, especially like, you know, putting really inflammatory um, posts, especially on Facebook, um, in, um, you know, to try and manipulate the U.S. election. Um, so after those sanctions were levied, um, the interesting thing is that that then um, the timeline lines up for when um, Wagner, Prigozhin, the Russian IRA turned their attention to Africa, um, into African countries where Russia was trying to gain um, a foothold. Um, so maybe they had more time on their hands then. Um, maybe they, um, yeah, you know, we're going to avoid the U.S. for a little while. But then it, it was interesting because then, um, you know, initially a lot of the, the disinformation looked pretty similar to what the tactics that have been tried in the U.S. Um, but then gradually kind of a, a more sophisticated model um, started to be developed in um, Sudan, Libya, elsewhere of this, this franchising model where um, the Wagner Group would contract um, local individuals um, to start writing and creating these disinformation posts and these campaigns, um, you know, themselves. Um, and all of a sudden, the, the quality of the disinformation went way up um, because, you know, these are people in Khartoum and Sudan who actually know um, the local dialect, who understand the political context, who understand the hot button issues, instead of someone in Moscow or St. Petersburg writing these posts, it's somebody in, in Sudan. Um, and so that was really kind of a, um, a breakthrough, I think, that helped make these, these campaigns more successful. Um, and then over time, that, that model's been refined. Um, it's, it's proved really difficult to detect um, and to have removed because it is, you know, local people, um, oftentimes not in authentic accounts. Um, but that model then has been, you know, kind of the way analysts um, who follow the US closely, as I understand it, um, they kind of saw that as a lower stakes for Russia testing ground where they thought, you know, people aren't watching the, the Facebook space in Sudan um, or they're not watching it in, in Mozambique. So let's test out these new methods, this new disinformation model there. And then we'll go back to the US with it if it works. Um, so that, that's kind of one theory of, of how um, Russia, you know, of course, using this, this information in Sudan and elsewhere um, to their, their advantages, um, but also kind of a using it as a, a testing ground um, where they thought it wouldn't be detected initially. We have, uh, we have a, an eager hand raised to jump in in this part of the discussion. So Christina, take it away with your question. Sure. So, I mean, I think this was one of the things that was most fascinating to me was like the idea that this could become so pervasive using influencers on, um, you know, the internet, on social media as a way of getting this disinformation out in a way that is very relatable to people, right? It might be somebody that's already on their, their newsfeed or whatever it is. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how it is that like these people are being recruited, right? Like what is the messaging that goes into reaching out to somebody who already has great influence on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is and getting them to say like, yeah, here, you can have access to my account or like, yeah, sure, I'll post X, Y, and Z for you. Like I think about influencers here and how that's very much money driven, right? It's marketing. So what what is like, what's the drive? What's the incentive for these folks to hand over this information or to, to start distributing this information on behalf of someone else? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question and really going to be um, necessary that more research goes into it, that question, you know, if, if this is going to be stopped um, or if the strategies are going to be developed to kind of combat this ta tactic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really opaque right now. Um, 
why, why are, uh, and how are these contacts being made? Um, how are they, um, you know, what are the, the payments? Are they, how are those being facilitated? We don't really know. Um, there, um, there is some evidence from Kenya um, that's been documented that, um, you know, influencers have rented out their accounts for these political campaigns um, that individuals are being contracted to post um, you know, several dozen posts across multiple accounts a day um, as part of these kind of trying to get a, a certain hashtag to trend or as part of um, harassing a journalist or something like that. Um, and then they're, they're paid through, um, in Kenya, there's a mobile money called M-Pesa um, and they're, they're paid through that. Um, or you know, elsewhere they they're paid through um, cryptocurrency. Um, you know, the the Central African Republic recently made cryptocurrency, made Bitcoin. It's not one of its national currencies, um, and that's you know believed to be um, a way to avoid sanctions because um, it's a, yeah, Russia, their number one um, international partner is Russia. Um, Russia is under numerous sanctions. Central African Republic is under numerous sanctions. So now with Bitcoin as a, a national tender that, that they can conduct um, transactions that way. Um, but for like the people who are being paid to use their accounts or to do this franchising, um, yeah, I think you hit it on the nose. It's, it's, you know, it's a industry. It's um, a way to make a living. Um, it's um, not that difficult to work. And, you know, if in somewhere like Kenya where, um, the median income is is around fifteen hundred dollars a year. Um, if somebody's making ten dollars a day, um, just posting on on Twitter, um, that's a that's a pretty good income, and that's um, a pretty low overhead um, for a you know a wealthy politician or um, you know for a foreign actor to pay. Versus you know that's why I think this model is. Um, you know, I don't know the extent to which it's it's being used in the United States or Europe, um, but the overhead would would be much higher there to kind of to pay an influencer um, who's getting um, you know large contracts to do advertising to pay them to do this kind of thing. Whereas um, you know it's 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 much lower overhead to have this kind of um, campaign. And then the other element of it that I've, I've recently learned about um, is that kind of the way this. Um, franchising model is is being developed is kind of similar to um, intelligence operations um, where it's kind of or you know or for that matter um, uh, the way terrorist cells are set up um, where there's not really any contact with, between any of the people who are doing the posting who are doing the the really the disinformation campaigns they are each only talking to um, and communicating with one source kind of their handler um and so it's it's very much um fragmented so it's really hard to piece together even if one person comes forward as a whistleblower or one person says look somebody approached me to post this stuff it's, you can't really connect the dots to the broader campaign um so that's another another tactic to get to grapple with all right renee is going to jump in with the next question then we have regis right behind her Hi. Yeah. So my question is a, a two-part question. So one, um, how do you think we can standardize or regulate some sort of policy in terms of, um, you know, preventing mis or disinformation? Um, and then my second question is, um, especially on, you know, the African continent, um, building sustainability and having, you know, I, I remember one of the other speakers says, uh, I forgot the quote that he said, but it was something around, um, you know, Africans are the best to, um, to you know, pretty much work on the work that's being done. Um, so my quite that second part question is more um, uh, directed towards sustainability on the African continent. How can, you know, Africans um, in you know different countries, um, how can we build more sustainability? Um, when it comes to mis and disinformation. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's the uh, one of the million dollar questions. Um, 
is yeah, what does um, you know policy around disinformation look like? Um, and I think it's it's really a sticky um, sticky issue right now because um, it's so easy to go overboard and to kind of pass like way too broad of a um, a policy aimed at at combating disinformation. Um, and we've seen this in in a country like Benin in West Africa. They passed. Um, uh, a cyber law that was um, to prevent the spreading of, of fake news. Um, but it was written way too broadly where um, just any individual who shared uh, inadvertently, you know, whether they had malicious intent or not, just shared um, fake news on their social platform could be charged under this law. Um, and so it gets back to the, the issue I was talking about between mis and disinformation um, in that really we need policies tailored very specifically to kind of these broader campaigns that are, um, you know, they're really sophisticated and they involve multiple fake accounts, they involve coordination, um, this broader pattern, not just somebody, not just your, your aunt sharing um, an article she comes across on, on, on Facebook. Um, so that, that's one of the challenges for designing policies. Um, and, um, as we've seen, you know, it, it's it's kind of can be abused where countries can say that they're dedicated to combating this kind of um, disinformation, but then develop these kind of codes that then are actually used to target journalists or to target opposition members, which is exactly what happened in um, Benin. Um, this this law has been used to um, imprison um, journalists who are been accused of of spreading um, disinformation just by sharing things on there or writing things on Facebook. Um, so that's that's one really big challenge. Another is that there's often a political disincentive um, for um, you know, uh, political parties in power or presidents in power um, to really um, think hard about this issue and to develop these policies because oftentimes disinformation campaigns in their countries are benefiting them, um, especially um, in the African context. Um, a lot of the foreign disinformation, um, the, the Russian disinformation is um, pro the regime in power um, and you know cheerleading them to re-election, um, defending them against accusations. Um, and so why, why would the, the appeal in power then um, come up with policies to, to, to deter that? Um, so that's another challenge. Um, so, but I think, yeah, so there, really there's, there's not gonna be any silver policy bullet. There's really gonna have to be a um, multi-stakeholder, um, multi-sector approach. Um, and I think that's the only way we get to any kind of sustainable, I mean, in, in, we're like so early days, I feel like in, in terms of developing these policies and coming up with solutions. I think um, my own kind of uh, pessimistic outlook is that um, this information is gonna get worse before it gets better, that this is only the beginning um, in a lot of these African countries. You know, I think um, the model is still being pioneered. It's still spreading, it's still being adopted, um, but it really is going to take um, a whole society approach. I mean, in countries where we've seen some um, some success in the Baltic countries like Estonia and Latvia that have been exposed to Russian disinformation for um, more than a decade now online, um, they have partnerships between um, state institutions, between civil society, um, you know, activist citizens. Um, so that's, I think that's the only way you get to any kind of sustainability is, is to build these kind of institutions that um, span different sectors of society. Thank you so much for your question, Renee. And I'm, I'm gonna follow up. I think the quote came from Evans, uh, from uh, who was uh, put forward by our uh, six covenant site in Nigeria. Uh, so so I'm, I'm gonna dig a little deeper into her second question. So uh, people of African descent are often discouraged uh, from studying our own cultures and, and people, um, uh, people call that practice colloquially me-search. Uh, so while non-Black scholars, particularly white male scholars are lauded and elevated for that work, 
So I'm hoping you can comment on this and also what you do to encourage and elevate uh, the work of black scholars. I know that the entirety of your career has been spent in, in, in spaces uh, where you have studied and, and, uh, and, and deepened had, and developed a deep knowledge of, of many of our cultures. So I'd love to hear about that. And then also, um, you know, as an, as an academic, uh, you know, in sociology, we say re reflexivity, thinking a lot about um, how, who we are, what that brings into spaces and being intentional. So if you could talk a little bit about your process of arriving into context where you are other, everybody in this room is often other in academia being uh, mostly non-white scholars, uh, and how you ensure you're honoring the experiences of the, the people that you engage with. And I know you've thought about this deeply, so we're looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I'm incredibly privileged to do the research I do um, and have benefited, like you say, from being a white male in this space. Um, you know, doing my, my research in Nigeria um, for my dissertation or my undergraduate research in Kampala in Uganda, um, it, you know, it, it, it facilitated my research to be a white man very clearly, like doors open for me, people were willing to meet with me. Um, and, you know, that's something I've struggled with, because those, you know, there's such brilliant scholars in these countries who could never get a meeting with a government official or with, you know, the, the leading academic um, in the country. Um, so I've always tried to have like as, as much of a kind of um, my research method is kind of just um, being um, talking to, to people, to average people and being kind of um, low key, I think is, is how I would call it. Um, um, I've always been more of an informal researcher, just meeting people, having conversations, um, learning um, from, from people who are experts who know way more about the stuff than I ever could. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really ended up attracting me to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies was that we're mandated to understand African security issues from an African perspective. Um, and that, that's what really what we, we try and do. Um, and we try and um, talk to, you know, have as, as wide of a network as we can to talk to African experts um, you know, to meet them, to be here in Kenya, talking to people, um, learning from them, and then as much as possible, giving them a platform um, on our website. You can go to our website, um, and um, our goal is, is um, you know, ar around 50% of our works being published by external authors, preferably on the African continent. Um, and so, you know, if, if you know people who are experts in anything tangentially related to security, please reach out to me because we are always eager to um, help, um, you know, give them a platform to talk to them, um, to help them publish articles on our site um, and to provide like mentorship um, and editing as um, they develop their ideas. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been, I think, um, naturally I tend to want to um, kind of, uh, be in the background. So <laughs> Nanette has uh, forced me to do this presentation, this Q&A, but I, I would much rather it be being uh, a Kenyan, uh, being the author or, or speaking and, you know, just being a, a facilitator um, in, in kind of helping them get a platform through through my privilege. Yeah. And I, and I would love to ask that you, if, if since you are the expert here, if you provide a list of, of Black scholars we should be reading, we will put that on our website. Cool. So yeah. who are the people that inspire you? Who are the people that you reach to to speak on a regular basis? We will put that list on our website. Yeah. Um, I also, I'm definitely going to follow up uh, with you on what you just mentioned, because I, I study disinformation and misinformation, and I'm proud to have been included in the uh, academic minute on NPR this week. I just found out while we were talking, I think I was day three or day four this week uh, talking uh, talking about misinformation and disinformation and tackling that in the U.S. context. So I will definitely follow up with you. Um, so uh, and we'll get that list up on our website. So uh, Regis has our next question. Go ahead and spotlight Regis. Thanks. Yeah, my question is actually a little more methodological in a sense. Um, I was curious listening, you know, um, you talked about the key sort of one of the key elements of misinformation is the intent. And I was wondering, uh, you know, when you were going through it, 
uh, methodologically, how do you kind of make that determination of intent? I think you mentioned, you know, it originates from Russia or outside of the country or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. But, you know, what are the other factors that kind of go into the differentiated different disinformation from misinformation for you? Yeah, I think that's uh, you're really putting your finger on the, on the key element there. Um, you know, as I was describing with these um, uh, criminal statutes that have been written too broadly, um, that are including misinformation, the inadvertent spreading of, of fake news. Um, you know, there's not really an intent there to to deceive. Um, so yeah, the, and I I saw this question from you before, and I was trying to think about. Um, you know what what the method is and it really is just kind of um looking for patterns um there's no um i wish there was just a rubric where you say okay this is disinformation this is misinformation or this there's intent behind this um but it's it's looking for kind of connecting the dots that this is that these campaigns um are not a one-off that they're they are a um coordinated campaign that they um, you know, have been developed in, in a sophisticated manner to um, both be inauthentic and coordinated um, and to, to, you know, have some kind of scale. Um, and I think both those elements are, are really important for kind of helping establish intent um, because you can have, um, you know, inauthentic fake bot accounts. But if they're not coordinated, if they're just randomly liking things on, on Facebook, I mean, yeah, it's not great. It's it's distorting um, the the space, but it's not really manipulating it um, or trying to um, trick people in kind of a um, a broader broader way. Um, we're trying to work the algorithms to have something trend or like that. Uh, and likewise, if if something is just if there's just a bunch of coordinated accounts um, that aren't fake that are you know real people, well, that's just like that's a social movement, right? That's people um coordinating together that that's 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 oftentimes activism um and that's obviously not something that wants to be uh we want to be suppressing either so it's when those two elements come together when it's um inauthentic and coordinated i think that's when you start to see that okay this is um whoever's behind this campaign is intending to manipulate and, and deceive um so i think that that's that's kind of that's kind of how i approach it um and understand it so we have our next question from Gitamsa and then Daniel. Okay, uh, sorry for the camera. The video is not working, but uh, I want to ask you about is the, you are working on the African Strategy Center. I was wondering that, uh, you know, in Ethiopia, there was a civil war, which is happened since November, 3 2020 and uh, i hope there is a lot of disinformation regarding to the war even the cause of the war even the peace dialogue recently also has a lot of disinformation and also you know that the, there is a lot of actor has been involved in this uh, civil war so is that your center has come across a lot of information like disinformation regarding with the civil war in ethiopia Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, you probably know far more about the Ethiopian context than I do. Um, uh, we included I think, a couple documented cases from um, Ethiopia and Eritrea around, especially around the, the Tigray um, civil war conflict in the north. Um, and just trying to remember all the, the details of it, but my understanding was um you know part of that the disinformation around what was happening was really facilitated by the fact that there was a media blackout in the Tigray region while the conflict was happening um journalists were not allowed in and, um you know, reporters um were, were stopped from going to the region um, the internet was cut so it was it was this this black hole of information where um which is where disinformation thrives right um when there can't be verified reports coming out um anyone can can put on facebook or put on twitter that okay well this is what's happening i know i have an aunt there who's telling me this or 
Um, I have um, a cousin who's who's in the in the conflict, and this is what hap is happening. Um, so I think um, both sides were were doing that kind of seeding of of stories, seeding of false narratives, or or at least unverifiable um, narratives. Um, and then you know it got a little bit better. Some reporting um, did come out. Um, some um, human rights groups were allowed to go in and, and start providing some documentation as to what was happening. Um, and then the, the other element um, was that there was this massive um, diaspora um, effort to um, kind of shape the narrative of the war and direct it at um, international organizations, diplomats, reporters. Um, and this is one of those, those gray areas where um, it's, um, you know, what, what defines activism and what defines disinformation? Um, you know, if people are just creating a Twitter account because they want to participate in this and then they're just sharing something that's been copied and pasted and sent to them to share, um, but, you know, they're a real person, they believe in this, um, is that disinformation or not? Um, and it's something that, that um, I don't think there's a, there's a clear answer to. Um, you know, and it depends on the content that's being shared, whether it's, um, you know, fabricated or not, whether it is accurate, whether it kind of um, is meant to deceive or, or not, or whether it's just, you know, messaging, um, you know, an aggressive uh, kind of PR campaign. So, you know, these are all those, those areas where um, it really, disinformation, you know, it's, it's slippery and, um, one of the things that was also seen in the conflict was, um, so because there was so much mis and disinformation, um, people, you know, a lot of fact checking um, organizations were trying to monitor what was happening in real time, monitor what was being posted on Twitter. And then what um, was seen was that, um, you know, some of the participants in the conflict were setting up their own fact checking organizations and then you know providing kind of weaponizing that that um trope of fact checking um to fact check the fact checkers or to fact check the other side um so then it really kind of spirals into this this sticky situation where people don't know uh, um who to believe don't know who is is providing accurate information um but yeah i'd, I'd be curious to hear more on on your perspective and, and kind of um what what you see as uh, is is did you see that disinformation or is it still ongoing or um, did you have a different different perspective? And Mark, I'll ask you to drop your email in the chat box because I'm hoping uh, you and Gatumsa and others uh, will have a chance to connect on this question and others. Uh, while you work on that, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to Regis's, then we'll throw it to Daniel, then Renee, and then back to Regis. So uh, my question uh, with uh, the types of methods um, that uh, you use, Mark, you sent that directly to me, send it to everybody. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, so I'm thinking about the work of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and I'm wondering if there's anyone over there doing experimental work on, um, on disinformation and uh, misinformation. So it's a common practice within a lot of organization to do uh, testing of uh, the people within, within the fold uh, to, you know, to send fake emails and see if people click on things, if they, you know, like they want that million dollars. Uh, just so you all know, uh, uh, um, the founder of Microsoft's wife is sending us $100 billion. I got that email yesterday. Uh, so I didn't click on it, but uh, do you all do any experimental work on disinformation and misinformation on the spread of fake stories that are, are, are potentially of your of your own creation? Uh, and if if not, uh, are you interested in that? Because I have some time. Yeah, I would be fascinated to talk to you about that. Um, we don't do any of that. I mean, we are a small, small organization. Um, and um, as we were talking in the, the waiting room, um, there's 54 countries in Africa and we try and Keep on top of them all so um you know a lot of times we're talking to experts who are really doing the nitty-gritty work and then we're trying to provide that that platform we're trying to amplify their work trying to connect it to policy makers trying to kind of put it in a policy language um so we're not so much on the the techie side um but no we're, we're always trying to innovate and trying to be creative though um when we can <laughs> yeah <laughs> Cool. All right, Daniel, jump in. 
great. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your work, Mark, and also thank you for the awareness that you bring to your work as a white scholar in particular. I think that's something we can all appreciate. Um, I'm curious about, um, so the way that I've observed that disinformation tends to be discussed is mostly as like a state issue, um, sort of like Russian leading state disinformation campaign. But um, I'm very interested in the role of private corporations. I'm, I'm reminded about the US context post uh, January 6th riot, we have like analyses showing that corporations are donating like $8 billion plus dollars to GOP candidates who continue to push the lie about the 2020 election. Um, and I think particularly given the African context and the way in which it is continually exploited by private corporations that they are, I would imagine the continent is particularly susceptible to private corporation led disinformation campaigns. So I'm just wondering if you have any sort of perspective or, or insights there. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you for the question. Um, and it's something I've, I've wondered about too. Um, in our data set, I think there was one or two um, campaigns that were detected and documented that were linked. Um, you know, they were tied to global marketing firms. Um, so there was um, one, I'll have to go back and look up the details, but I think there was one in um, Egypt and Tunisia, and then there was another, um, there was a, a British um, uh, PR firm that had um, basically dabbled in disinformation for, but you know, they had been kind of the middleman for the, um, uh, the South African Gupta brothers um, and the Zuma administration who had been part of the state capture there where basically um, you know, the privatization of, of state resources, um, you know, and those being sold to political elites and, and captured by political elites. Um, and this um, British PR firm was basically um, kind of on its own innovating um, disinformation um, to distract from from what was happening um, and was hired by these individuals who were doing the, the profiteering um, from South Africa's resources. Um, and it was really um, very um, disturbing what they did um, because they started using xenophobic um, content, um, racist content, um, to stir up animosity in South Africa um, between there's you know there's uh, there's tension in South Africa between um, South African citizens and African immigrants in the country um, and there's often um, xenophobic um, violence that politicians stoke um, and that's basically what this PR firm was doing so I think that it, it is there um, it's oftentimes tied into politics this kind of um, um, corporate disinformation, um, and oftentimes that, that, you know, or not often, but the, the, the few documented cases we have, um, it's these corporate entities being the, the middleman kind of being the ones, um, you know, taking PR, um, or, uh, marketing too far and creating disinformation. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm really curious. I'd be really curious to know what else is being done, what else isn't being detected, what corporations are um, uh, implementing disinformation campaigns in, in African markets. Um, I, I, I don't wanna speculate, but it, it would be a surprise to me if it's not happening. Um, if, um, and my, my guess would be it's oftentimes tied to politics, try it tied to um, political elites. Um, but you know, um, until until this comes to light, we really, we really don't know. So um, just my plug that we need more, more researchers, more funding, more capacity building um, for um, people looking at these spaces and really, really digging into it, because it's, it's not easy work. Um, the, the Kenyan, um, who I met last night, whose name was, um, his name is o Odenga Madung, 
and keep an eye out for him because he's like the top guy for disinformation research in, in Kenya. Um, he just had an uh, op-ed published in The Guardian this week. Um, he's, he's led the, the TikTok research that I was mentioning. Um, and um, he was describing what his, his research process is like. And it's, it's literally spending like a whole day on his phone and computer watching these TikTok videos or scrolling through tweets and going down rabbit holes and like line by line um, creating spreadsheets of, of the disinformation that he's seeing and then tying it together and then bringing it to the attention of these platforms and trying to have them, you know, give him a peek um, behind the curtain and share what they're seeing. Um, and how these these um, different posts and accounts are connected. Um, so it's really laborious and work and requires going down these rabbit holes and seeing, um, in, you know, the case of TikTok, um, incitement to, to violence. And um, so, yeah, I just uh, another plug to that. More of this work needs to be done. Um, and I just I dropped it in the uh, I just dropped the article in the chat box for folks that uh, want to see a TikTok Kenyan elections violence yeah. and tribal hatred yeah. that is in the uh, chat box. Renee has our next question. Hi, I have uh, two other questions. My first question is um, kind of related to the first question that was asked with the differences with um, mis and disinformation, um, you know, when we look at Africa compared to like Europe and uh, US. But I want to ask if you see any differences uh, within the African um, countries. Do you see any differences with mis and, di and disinformation um, among the 54 countries? And then my second question is um, what, I don't know if I missed it in the video, but um, for you personally, um, why were you interested in this work and why Africa? Yeah, thanks um, for those questions. Um, yeah, so in terms of difference between countries in Africa, um, you know, there are definitely differences there uh, in designing a disinformation campaign. Um, you know, blending in, camouflaging, um, knowing the local political debates, the local hot button issues, that's the key. So, you know, the kind of um, the issues and the content varies from um, place to place. But I'd say that generally the model has, um, and the tactics have kind of been pioneered um, by um, Russian actors, by other external actors. Um, you know, there, there are differences that, that, you know, the Ethiopian example, that's a little bit different of a, of a model. Um, the Eritrean example is a little bit different um, in which they were kind of setting up um, their own kind of experts and then kind of laundering conspiracy theories through them. Um, so, but, but mostly it's the same kind of model of, of setting up um, a bunch of um, fake accounts um, using those to set up fake pages to then coordinate um, fake posts um, or um, you know, to try and game algorithms to just get these messages to um, be seen um, and spread and shared. Um, and then really what, what differs is um, what that, that content is. Um, and then you, you mentioned um, mis- and disinformation in Africa um, and how that differs from place to place. So one other thing I, I would just mention there is that um, what my understanding is, you know, in um, friends I have, colleagues I have um, who are in Nigeria, who are in Kenya, elsewhere, there is just a lot of misinformation on African social media. Um, you know, on, people show me their WhatsApp um, conversations with their, their parents or their grandparents or their relatives. And um, there's a lot of just kind of um, conspiracy theories. You know, some of it's just like fun stuff like UFOs, um, kind of the stuff we see in like tabloids here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's um, not necessarily malicious. It's just kind of people having a laugh. Some of it's like satirical. 
Um, but um, and of course we have that in the US too. Um, but it's it's seems to be particularly rife on WhatsApp, which uh, a lot of people, um, like every African has WhatsApp on their phone. Um, and so I think um, that really helps create this environment where then disinformation campaigns can kind of blend in and camouflage amongst that, um, that misinformation. Um, and, you know, part of that is, is um, digital literacy. Um, you know, we don't have great digital literacy in the US, um, but it's, it's, it's a problem in a number of African countries too, where, um, you know, people, um, you know, oftentimes don't finish secondary school. They don't have um, a university education. Um, and now several cell phones have really revolutionized um, that everyone's connected to the internet. Well, not everyone, but, um, you know, there's more internet users and social media users in Africa as a continent than the United States. Um, so um, I, I was just talking to an um, NGO um, in um, Nairobi today that they're, they're called the, um, the Youth Cafe. Um, and their current project, um, they've really seen the need for dig digital literacy amongst young people. They did a bunch of research, a bunch of focus groups, and basically, um, the majority of young people they were talking to really couldn't discern between what was fake news, what was real news, um, what was good reporting, what was bad reporting. Um, so now they've developed this handbook of um, digital literacy that um, is going to be used to run all these programs. Um, then they're going to, you know, distill it down to kind of uh, TikTok length um, videos and posts to help um, help this spread. But um, that's another element of it. Um, and then how did I um, get interested in, in, in African, African studies, African history? Um, that's a long story, but um, it, it goes back to when I was an undergrad at um, the University of Virginia. Um, I had some really good mentors um, who um, encouraged me to study abroad in Uganda and Rwanda. Um, I had awesome um, homestay experiences there. Um, made friends who I still keep in touch with and, you know, just kind of ran with it from there. Just really became interested in um, learning um, African perspectives on um, world history, on economics, on politics, um, because, you know, I think it, it just is, um, it's left out of our, our curriculum um, in, in high school and college. Most people don't um, really, you know, it's, it's, world history classes in high school don't mention Africa or they mention Egypt and they mention colonialism and they leave out, you know, thousands of years of, of cultures and um, really, you know, my, um, my other interest is, is African architecture and African urbanism. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's really my, my passion. Um, and there's just so much fascinating, um, urbanism, architecture, buildings um, in, in West Africa, um, you know, the, the Yoruba kingdoms, the Ashanti, there's just so much there that people don't know about um, and that really challenged, I think, our inherited ways of, of viewing history and um, viewing um, uh, what is progress and what is, um, you know, what kind of political systems um, and economic systems um, that we've inherited and, and should continue to do. So, yeah. <laughs> so moder moderator's choice, I get to squeeze in the very last question and thanks folks for a little bit over, uh, but we wanna make sure uh, we get in uh, this last question. So I'm just curious, since I never see this question asked of folks like you in these spaces, how do you balance family and work? <laughs> Um, Every question. woman gets asked this question. So I feel like I want to end on that. How do you balance family and work, Mark? Yeah, um, I don't have kids, so that helps. <laughs> I have two dogs who I guess you saw in the video, you saw uh, <laughs> the interruption and one of them pop up. Um, and I'm um, my partner has a, a full-time, much, much busier job than I do. She's a lawyer, so 
um, that always puts it in in perspective. <laughs> um, so I'm the the cook, the dog care keeper. Um, yeah, <laughs> but no, it's 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 a, a constant struggle, especially uh, work from home um, and, and keeping those guardrails on the day and not just uh, spending all day on the computer. But get a dog, <laughs> then you have to take them out and go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. I deeply appreciate your willingness to to be in front of the camera. I know, as you mentioned, you're a person who prefers sort of be behind the scenes. I know a lot of folks here are probably going to follow up with questions. Uh, and uh, I, I'm excited about that list from you. Like, and, and, and don't feel like there needs to be guardrails on your list of scholars that we all need to read. If you send me a thousand names, I will put a thousand names on our website. Uh, we, we, we cite Black folks here, so please tell us who we should be reading. Thank you all for watching. For more information on Six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.